Alex, do you want to say anything before I introduce you, Nandoni? Or uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, unfortunately, I'll I'll just be saying facts um, because I still haven't had the pleasure of working closely with uh, Jan and Donnie yet. Uh, but uh, you you guys have, so I'll just say a few words, and then you're welcome to give a more personal uh, introduction. So um, Jan and Donny today is joining us from the University of Nebrija, um, and he is a cognitive scientist um, and also, importantly, a director of the uh, del Centro de Investigación Nebrija en Cognición. Um, and uh, he's also affiliated with the Basque Center on Cognition, Brain, and Language. And of course, he is a professor two uh, at some of the projects uh, here at Aqua Aurora affiliated with um, us here. So today he will be telling us about uh, the bilingual monster. Um, and I'm very, very curious to see uh, how, how that goes. Um, so without further ado, uh, if, if you want, want to say something, Jason, um, and we can start. Well, I, I don't need to say much. You, you took all the facts, so I think. Oh, those I'm are sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. That's fine. That, that, that's all accurate. Um, you know, uh, it's really. I just want to say it's wonderful to have Yolandoni with us um, in the in the flesh, as it were. So uh, this is great and a very nice pre-Christmas uh, present for everybody. Um, I, Alex, as I think you said, because the volume was a little bit down. Um, you know, in addition to the wonderful work that Ian and Donny has done as uh, a, a, a cognitive psychologist working uh, on various domains of language and also neurocognition and bilingualism um, throughout his career, which is um, short but long by certain measures, right? Um, Very you know, prolific. Uh, yeah, uh, is uh, extremely prolific across a really interesting and wide range of topics, of course, all centering around what I suppose he's going to talk to us today and this gigantic monster that we're all dealing with, um, that is bilingualism. We're really very privileged and happy to have him uh, as part of our team here as well. Um, and so I'll just leave it at that without further ado. It's really great to have him. Those of us that are here, we have a lot of food to eat. And thanks for joining online. And I'll give it over to you. Thank you. I only said thank you. <laughs> Hold on till the end. <laughs> so, uh, well, thank you so much for, for the invitation. I mean, it is really a pleasure uh, being here with you. Uh, it would be even better pleasure if this would work. Wait. Now, especially in this context of, of the virus that we all know about, uh, yesterday someone was asking me, I think it was Janina, whether this was my first uh, travel out. Uh, well, it's not my first one, but it's the first one that I really wanted to do. So thanks for the invitation. It, it was time for me to come and, and really I, I promise I will be back very soon because uh, I, I will only present you some of the data from here and there that ultimately speak about the difficulty of, of uh, conceiving this bilingual person, that monster that I will introduce. And uh, I will leave a big, big package for another visit. Uh, so if you ask me something that I don't know the answer for, I will simply invent that this will come next time. Okay, And then I will run the experiment in the meantime. So why, why this bilingual monster? Oh, sorry, I'm getting too close. Uh, I guess that we are all familiar with the story of, of multilingualism uh, from different perspectives, but just in case we are not, simply a couple of uh, essential references from developmental, developmental psychologists uh, in the late, uh, uh, so it's, it's more than 100 years ago, but, but still it's, it's yesterday in, in the history of the human being. The, some people thought that uh, if a kid is uh, bilingual, uh, his intellectual or spirit, spiritual growth would not be doubled, but halved. And that has been written in a, in a report, in a scientific report. So people took these things kind of seriously, assuming that being bilingual is not good. Uh, the second one is a bit more extreme, if you wish. The use of a foreign language in the home 
the use of a foreign language in the home. Just that bit of the sentence already, well, it's a red flag. But uh, it's one of the shift factors in producing mental retardation. So come on, really? Are we that, we, that kind of monsters? And if we are, fine. According to these uh, words, we would all be mentally retarded, retarded, but equally mentally retarded. So but that's fine. But that, that's strange, isn't it? Then other things came more scientific, if you wish. So in another side of this polyedric image of the bilingual, uh, showing that, and, and really this has been replicated plenty of times in different language combinations, that if you're tested, and, and this comes to the earlier meeting that we were having before on, on how to test bilingual persons, right? Uh, if you are tested with uh, personality questionnaires and measures that, that are available to all of us in like the delivery, uh, you will show different uh, profiles, personality profiles in different scales and subscales, uh, depending on whether you are tested in one language or the other. And this uh, is not really related to the amount of knowledge you have of the language or the amount of use of the, of the language that match. It's simply because there are different languages, you take things slightly differently and you react to them differently too. But does this mean that you are that person like two in one? So what, what are we? Sorry, this is getting hot here. Uh, it, it is difficult. It is difficult to understand uh, how to conceive a bilingual person without thinking that that's a bilingual monster, especially knowing that we give different personality answers. So we are not the same person or we say that we are not the same person. That's strange. Moreover, we know that we live in a bilingual world. So this is a monster's world then, right? Because we know that this is I mean, the typical sentence that we start the papers with, so bilingualism or multilingualism is not uh, the exception anymore. This is the rule nowadays in the world. It is true. It's a it's, it's rule. So more than, according to the count, 75% of the, of the population is, is multilingual in one degree or another. So uh, this is a terrible world of monsters. And, and this is my micro world of monsters. So here is my Anne, there is my Oyer. Uh, yeah, we speak in Basque and suddenly they come and speak in Spanish, even though daddy and mommy don't speak to them in Basque, sorry, in Spanish, but they learn Spanish from the environment. These are my monsters. If someone wants to call them monsters, come and tell it to me, okay? Only I, well, and mommy can tell them monsters. So let's let's take a closer look at, at how this uh, potential monster can be or why we think it can be a monster, not because of the personality things that we can all infer where the problem comes from. The interpretation of one uh, sentence or one word is not going to be the same. So the, so the instances in which uh, we think of when we are completing a personality questionnaire will be clearly different. Therefore, probably the values that we will give are going to be different. Therefore, we are going to show different personality traits. Fine, but this is a matter of understanding, a matter of wording, a matter of semantics. Fine, I don't care that much about that. I care about other things that based on communication. Is communicating in, in a single language scenario different per se than communicating in, in a dual language or multilingual scenario, yes or no? So uh, we will go step by step, first analyzing the, the monster's uh, mind when communicating. And I will start by, by talking about uh, something that when we thought about this effect at the beginning, we already gave it a name without knowing that we would capture the effect. But this is the fun of our work. You think of something, you become super excited with the idea of a, a new discovery, and then you put a name to it, and then <laughs> the effect is null. And then, well, here in this case, we, we found something. And we were calling it the NAP effect. I was calling it the NAP effect with the team because it really happens to me as something related to a NAP. So imagine that you are a, a native Spanish speaker, who speaks English as well or not as I do, okay? <laughs> so that level of crappy English, fine. Uh, but you are able to understand others in English. And your only aim at this moment is to take a nap. That's what you want. Which makes sense, I know, <laughs> right? Fine, so you are that person. Uh, imagine that you switch on TV because you think that it will help you get asleep. And the TV is in your foreign language be it English in my case, okay? 
if you have experienced this situation, you switch TV on, you don't care that much about what's going on on TV because your aim is to sleep, you get a nap and you rest peacefully and that's fantastic. However, if uh, the TV is in your native language, uh, and remember that you don't care about what's being played on TV, but simply they are speaking in a language that really captures your attention. So it's a bit more difficult sometimes to, to get this rest or nap because from time to time you simply open the eye and say like, oh, what did they say about the whatever, uh, the volcano in the Palma, right? Uh, you would understand exactly the same in English or not the same, but uh, let's say almost everything, but still you take the nap. So that's why we called it the nap effect in real life. Uh, and, and this is a perfect example of it. Uh, if you go to a conference and if you are not a native English speaker, and if the conference as it typically is, is in English, <laughs> you have little problems to rest. Uh, we all know this. Okay, uh, fine. So we, we started the research agenda to understand whether we really deactivate ourselves in a way when, when uh, listening something in, in a foreign language as compared to a native language. Uh, to me, this is one of the most fantastic phenomena uh, from the neuroscientific uh, literature on, on language and cognition in last years. The, the ability of the human brain to dance at the same rhythm of the or fluctuate if you wish at the at the same rhythms of the input, and in this case, input would be not music but uh, the, the the voice of a person speaking in a given language. So, if you are not familiar with this, you know that, that there is electric activity in the brain, and and you can uh, map this electric activity in different frequency bands. So, as as with the radio, you can you can uh, move the dial and and get one or different frequencies. And there, there is a pattern, there is a pattern like oscillatory pattern as, as the one you see up here. Wait, just a second. No, that's not fine. Um, so so uh, different frequencies, different movements, rhythms, and then it comes your input. Okay, so someone is speaking to you. Speaking to you, imagine in your native language. Hmm? We also know that if you take this piece of voice and, and you process it, you can get different waves. The waves corresponding to the to the auditory signal. Yep. Uh, so you have the spectral power and blah 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 blah. So the, the magic of uh, that has been found in the last like 15 years or so is that our brain activity, not all the brain activity, but parts of the brain activity in a specific location and in a specific uh, oscillatory bands or frequency bands, gets tuned and dances at the same rhythm as uh, the rhythm imposed by the auditory input because you cannot change that. That's given. Right. What you can do is adjust yourself automatically, so you don't really explicitly do it, but it, the brain does it. And apparently this is core to uh, communication. So there is not much we can do for this. It happens and, and it's kind of cool because then we all thought that parts of, of uh, uh, intelligibility, understanding, communication was grounded on these principles of uh, oscillatory uh, activity and trainment between the input and, and my, my brain activity. Fine. What happens, and that's why the title is The Sleeping Brain, what happens in, in a foreign language? Uh, we did exactly this type of experiments, but now putting people uh, trying to understand the foreign language and the native language and contrasting them. So what it happens is that you do get the same. So in this case, imagine for me, English as a foreign language, uh, you do get some sort of um, activity that reminds you to the original one with the native language, but the core of it is completely different. The core is simply telling you that you are doing different underlying neural processes. You do understand what you hear, but via different pathways. There's only a minimal residual that resembles what's going on in the native language. So the activity would be pretty much the same as the oscillatory activity you would get for an unknown language. And that's the, the, the marvel of, of this foreign language comprehension because it's a language that you know and your brain reacts to it as reacts at this level of oscillatory activity and trainment. It reacts the same way as it would react to Russian for me, an unknown language, yeah? We did this, uh, we now, we had uh, several experiments to show this, but, but the first one we, we used, it was very easy. So people were listening to, to audio clips of uh, Kramer versus Kramer, the, the movie. So different uh, characters speaking to each other, the same uh, bit of the movie, pretty long, in different languages. 
with content. I mean, it was a movie, so they were like delivering information. And, and these guys were asked about uh, the content later on just to make sure that they were paying attention. And we, we saw that they were paying attention. Their task was not really to focus on what they hear, but to focus on a, a monitor of a, a screen monitor where a star was uh, appearing from time to time. And the star was most of the times black and sometimes it was red. So they simply needed to count the number of red stars they saw during the 20 minutes uh, experiment. Uh, they were not that many, so it was a very, very boring task. The critical thing is that the audio could be either in the native language, Spanish for these guys, or in a foreign language, English, or in a foreign but unknown language, uh, French. They didn't know French, they could not understand French, or no audio condition, which was the, the baseline, right? And here I'm, I'm only going to show you some uh, bars of, of, the, of the spectral power. Uh, what you see is, is a higher uh, power spectra in, in certain bands, and forget about the specific bands because that's, that's irrelevant for now, uh, for the native language. But the cool thing is that the foreign language was behaving pretty much the same as the unknown foreign language, okay? Still, when you test them afterwards, they were paying attention because they remembered many of the bits of information. So we do things that are completely different. I don't know whether it, it, it is having a different mind, but at least it is behaving completely differently. Yeah. Now, a situation that, that was a bit more fantastic even. So we, we would all like to analyze people during a conversational situation like this. But we instead we bring them individually to the lab and do <laughs> crappy experiments that are not very ecologically valid, so to say. Well, there are ways nowadays to to look at uh, the brain activity while these people do something more similar to conventional conversation. Yeah, that's called hyperscanning. Uh, in case you don't know it, uh, imagine that you have an EEG cap and. Here, everyone knows about the EEG cap, so you get some residual of the electrical activity of the brain. Uh, uh, but, but you use two caps, two persons, two caps. Perfect. You put this uh, on them and you ask them to do something. At the same time, you record their, their electrical, uh, the electric, uh, neuroelectric activity. And then you do some sort of, to make things easy, correlation between the activity of one person and the activity of the other person. It's not really a correlation, it's much more complicated, but what you try to do is you get the oscillatory pattern here, the oscillatory activity pattern here, and see whether there are some phases that look alike. Yeah, this is done by, by some stats uh, called the phase locking value, which is uh, finding similar rhythms. Uh, this is done this way. Essentially, you put two friends. Uh, in, in, this is important. In, in the experiment that I will present uh, here, I was with Alejandro, a friend of mine, but we are not talking about uh, known people. They were unknown to each other. So it was the first time they knew, they met. Okay, And that's, that's important because we've kept on doing experiments and that seems to be a factor. Uh, and we set them in a situation in which they had to speak to each other, but without knowing the other person and without seeing the other person. That was important for us. Okay, So it was like a telephone conversation, like a turn taking, uh, more specifically something like this. So this is uh, a picture of the of the design we were using. So you had the two persons in front of the computer and the computer was uh, telling you in which language you should say what. So the topics they should talk about for, uh, for 90 seconds each were like travel preferences, food choices, sport, uh, sports that they like and things like that. So like, really common topics. So, so the, the things you would talk uh, whenever you meet a person for the first time. And uh, including some sub questions that we had so that we could guide them because suddenly if you're setting this condition with the EEG cap on and a person who don't, you don't know next to you, and I tell you that please, you should talk for 90 seconds uh, on sports, uh, it may be the chance that you only say, I like football, that's it, <laughs> you know? But, but we needed them to speak. So, so we had some sub questions like, what's the, have you played any sport? Yes, for how long, blah, 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 blah. So helping or guiding them to speak for 90 seconds plus a counter so they knew that they were like 15 seconds left and, and so on fine so you get the, elect the electrical activity you do some processing of the analysis and at the very end what you have is is um, a message sender and the receiver so the speaker and the listener right and you have the message we know that the electric activity of the brain gets uh, tuned to to this message I've already shown you that, right? To the to the input, which is the, the, the verbal input. You can clean this and then take a look at what's going on in this brain. And in this brain, 
if there is any sort of interbrain connection once you have cleaned the, the effect of the message per se. So the, 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 the auditory signal per se. You filter this out and you still get some very cool brain-to-brain -brain entrainment effects. And, and this is simply due because we are made to be social and our brains are made to be social. Whenever you enter in the room and there's another person, your brains will most probably start dancing together at certain uh, frequency bands and moments. Okay, So that's, that's the social brain. This is boosted by communication. And here, I'm only presenting the second experiment because the first one was to, well, the, the science fiction one, to show that there was interbrain activity. The second one was to check whether if you speak in a native versus a foreign language to the person that you have next to you, there is different activity or interbrain uh, connectivity. And there is different. Here you have uh, how the two persons brains uh, work and where do you find this similar connectivity, sim sorry, similar oscillatory activity uh, between the brains. So this is interbrain connection, depending on whether you speak in the native language, green, or in a foreign language that the other person understands too, red. Okay. So these were Spanish speakers speaking either in Spanish or in English that they had like a relatively good command of. Yep. So magic happens, but magic is different. It's different for uh, native and foreign languages again, and they were able to understand each other. Hmm? Fine. Now that we know that the, the mind does completely different things when communicating in a foreign language, but we knew that I mean, we, this is just another way to show it, but what happens with emotions? And this is probably the, the part of the, of my research agenda that has been mm, the most shocking one in last years, because when I entered this world of emotions and foreign languages, I was very skeptical about the effects that had been reported because they are like really extreme. And then you start doing things and you check that even with a minimal amount of language context, you can replicate some effects that, that cannot be. I mean, in, in a, that we need to solve. And I will come to, to, to this at the end of the talk. So they, they do not make much sense. Uh, just to know minority heritage, second, additional, or foreign languages, we typically focus on the, the, the degree of expertise a person has in the language or the proficiency or mastery or fluency in, in the, those languages. We know that. But uh, when we say we, it's we, the field, but not you, because uh, you are experts in, in context. But, but many of us, we forget about the language use or language management or language context. And that clearly impacts the way we will process languages. Uh, so these are things that need to be taken into account, need to be quantified and qualified. That's, that's of course, for sure. Yeah. Uh, if not, we, we can end up talking about second languages as if they were foreign languages or foreign languages that are not foreign, but we call them foreign. Well, the first thing to keep in mind is that if we are talking about the foreign language per se, that's why at the beginning I mentioned that that sentence was ridiculous. If it is spoken at home, is it foreign? <laughs> So can it be foreign? Foreign to me is something that is foreign, so from abroad, yeah? But once I, I bring it here, then it's not foreign anymore, given sufficient context, I guess, right? So, so we need to take into account how we call things because that can make a difference. And I guess that this is one of the big uh, failures of, of our field, the, the psycholinguistic, not the linguistic, but the psycholinguistic field that we've talked about second, additional, and foreign languages as if they were all the same. And they are not. They are not. And this is our misery. Because now you go and read the paper and you don't really understand what they are showing or trying to convince you uh, of. Simply because they, we have not qualified and quantified things properly. That's, that, that's our fault, right? So that's why these sort of uh, connections are, are very useful. Well, and, and the, the critical hypothesis behind this different emotional reactivity to one and the other type of languages, and when I say one is native language and the other one is the foreign language, a language that is not spoken in your near context, but that you know of, uh, is that uh, whenever you are speaking in a, or living in a native language context, emotions and, and, and language come hand in hand because you, you have grown that way. So you have learned the language at the same time, time that you have been learning to develop your emotional repertoire. Yeah. In the case of foreign languages, the, the hypothesis is that depending on how you've learned it or how you, how, how you have approached the foreign language, 
uh, the emotional reactivity or resonance will be different. It's not that, that that's why the monster. So the monster cannot have emotions, right? I and mean, if you've seen the the movie, the the Frankenstein movie, it tells you clearly. So uh, it's it's not it's not only empathy. Is that it doesn't work the same. Remember, native languages typically are acquired in, in this, sorry for the prototypical family, but it was Google giving it to me. And uh, foreign language, the foreign language many times is learned uh, in a classroom context. And if this is the case, we need to think twice about this because the classroom context is not a naturalistic context. Uh, it's, it does not feed you with all the necessary pieces of information and, and pieces of information and, and experiences. So not everything comes uh, through a book, okay? And we use books many times to teach languages in the classroom context. This is yet the other big difference. We, under, we learn native languages this way. If you are lucky enough to hear and speak, then you can learn the native language this way. But many of us, we have learned the foreign language and foreign languages by reading and writing. And I don't know whether you're familiar with this uh, bit of the literature, but it's, it's, uh, I'll, I'll take some, I'll, I'll just tell you about one experiment that was done, which to me is, is mind blowing. So uh, there was a, a group of, of cognitive scientists that decided to analyze uh, decision making in a strange context. And the context was a, a divorce process. So people wanted to get, so couples wanted to get divorced and uh, they, they had to go to, to a counselor before going to, to court. So to, to check whether uh, there was the option to, to, to reach um, a, an agreement. Okay, between the two persons. So uh, they entered in the room with the idea of solving the issue or trying to, because if not, it was going to be extremely expensive for everyone. Okay, uh, The cognitive scientists asked the lawyer, the lawyers, to, in one group, simply let couples speak until they reach the, they made the, the agreement. And in the other group, simply do this by writing. So the communication, all the communication between the members of the couple should be by writing. Yeah. Can you imagine who were the ones arriving to, to an agreement, reaching the agreement faster? Oh, Why? Because if it is about speaking, we speak at a very fast rate. <laughs> we can say a lot of bad things in five minutes, right? <laughs> if you need to, and remember, this is these are not... Um, friendly approaches, okay? Because this is about money, this is about important issues. So really, you, it's not easy. The more you detach from the emotional side of the story, probably the better you, you will work, work and solve the issue. But this is about work, about money, about financial things, yeah? This is not about living in a language or learning a language. But however, we get these emotional detachment effects and we put them in the classroom context and we force students to learn a language via a book and writing, knowing that it involves emotional detachment. On top of this, there's the emotional detachment to the foreign language per se, because this is something that does not exist in your near context. It's only there outside. That's why it's foreign. Yeah. So it makes things a bit more complicated. Yeah. Uh, I don't know... How many of you know about this uh, well-known trolley dilemma? But it was the first you don't, so that's good at least. Uh, it, to me, this was really the reason why I entered the foreign language effects uh, world, because I cannot understand uh, what's going on here. So the trolley dilemma is something that comes from philosophy and that is not proper to linguistics, neurolinguistics, but that we have borrowed for just a, a language manipulation. The, the typical dilemma has two parts. In the first part, you are set in a situation in which you are that person uh, with a lever and that there's a train or a trolley or whatever that is that, that has no brakes because they, they're broken. And if you if nobody does anything uh, to stop the, the trolley, uh, it, it will, well, simply keep on the line. And there are like five persons that you don't know. And for some reason, they are there and cannot move. Yeah, imagine what will happen. 
if nobody does anything, those persons will die. Yeah. And you see that there's the lever there and they tell you that if you press the lever, it will change track and then it will go to the other track where there's only one single person there that you don't know either, okay? That person will die. Now the question for the big audience, for the world is, well, what would you do guys? Yes, no, right? If you ask this, regardless of the language you use for asking persons about this, consistently 80% of the population says, yes, I would press the lever because you, you get the five one numbers and you say, well, I mean, I, I poor person, but these are five. So I'm saving lives at the very end of the day. Yeah. So that's a decision made by really 80% of the population, regardless of the language used for asking this. Uh, you already see some differences behind. This is the second part of the dilemma. It's the fat man dilemma. Uh, yeah, not very polite, but whatever. And the idea is uh, now there's only a single track, then the trolley, the trolley has no brakes for five persons there. You are, you are uh, on top of a bridge with a fat man who's apparently that fat that if you push the fat man and throw uh, him down, uh, it will impact the, um, the trolley. And given this impact, the trolley will stop. But of course, the fat man will die. Would you push the fat man? Yes or no? That's the question of the philosophical dilemma. Remember, not a neurolinguistic dilemma, but philosophical, right? So you can start uh, making decisions on whether you know the person, blah, 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 blah. At the very end of the day, if you ask thousands of persons, what you get is this one. In your native language, if I ask you in your native language, only 20% of the, of the population would say yes to pushing the fat man. Before it was 80% pushing the lever, here, throwing the fat man, only 20%. Because you see yourself, I mean, and then we, we start like asking why, and people start telling you, well, I mean, it's because I don't want to kill the person. I feel that I am killing the person directly because I am doing the bad thing to the person directly. And in the other case, it was very indirect. It was just a lever that I did, so it was not me, blah, blah, blah. That, that's what happens, okay? But this has been asked also in the foreign language in different cultures, not in just 40 uh, students of a given college. No, in different cultures, different language combinations in different places of the world. And when you ask this in a foreign language, it's 40%, almost 40%, 38%, I think, uh, of, the, uh, of the respondents that, that say, yes, I would throw the fat man. So a different answer to an ethical, thus moral dilemma with clear-cut implications about lives and deaths. I don't know if we have two minds, but we make different decisions for sure. And this is clear. Right. Whatever. <laughs> now, what's the consequence of this? And let me let me drink coffee. Have you seen this movie? Yeah. <laughs> it is lovely. There, there is um, a colleague of us who, who did some studies on disgust and uh, the foreign language effect. And to make a long story short, there are like plenty of things that are disgusting across cultures also. So insects and, and uh, fluids of the body and other things that we don't like that much. Those are disgusting uh, for everyone or almost everyone, right? Um, the, the cool thing is that they were asked, they, they come from a business school and that's important to keep in mind. Okay, so the idea is to know how to sell things better, not to understand the human mind. Yeah. yeah? Uh, so the, the understanding the human mind is just a medium to get to the end, which is selling you something. And and these guys ask people whether they, well whether they would be uh, ready to drink artificial uh, meat or recycled water or uh, insect cookies and things the like. Okay, so nasty things. Uh, and they they had the option to say yes, no, only sometimes, only if I need, blah blah blah. And they were asking this in the foreign or in the native language. And you know what? If you are asked in the foreign language, you are more ready to eat the artificial meat than if you are asked in the native language. So the disgust level varies or re you react differently. And trust me, uh, for me saying carne artificial or artificial, artificial meat is pretty much the same. I do understand the concept. Well, actually, I don't understand the concept. I don't know uh, what's that made of. 
but it's not a language thingy. It's, it's more about what can be behind. So recycled water, would you drink recycled water? Recycled from what? No idea, sorry, <laughs> whatever. But the disgust reaction is also different depending on the language. I am sure you know about this, uh, insults and reprimands uh, offend differently or are processed differently in the native and in the foreign language. I guess that you know all these things, but this is, I mean, for me, it's much easier to, to say a nasty word now in English than saying it in Spanish. I would, my, my, my self-control would tell me, don't say that in Spanish. While in English, given that I am, I mean, doing other stuff that are costly enough, I, I have little filters, yeah. Now, our own stuff, sadness. Um, there are some things that when we read them, they, they are very impactful to us. So, especially if you if you read the newspaper, nothing is good. I mean, all is about uh, an assassin that blah, 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 or bad things, right, that make you sad. And this is simply because we react to what you, what we read. Um, when we say, when I say you react, is that your body reacts. There is the cognitive effort of reading things that you can measure with different uh, brain signals. MRI, EEG, MEG, even reaction times. But there's something about the, the, the more automatic psychophysiological responses that can be measured by simply getting um, information from the heart rate or the electrodermal activity, which is the micro sweat of your fingertips or your pupil dilation. When, when things come nasty or complicated, our pupils dilate, okay? when we speak in a foreign language, our people stay late because uh, behind there is a huge cost. I mean, working in the foreign language, it's not easy at all. So we, we, we created an experiment in which we had the different types of uh, sentences. Some of them were very neutral and some others were a bit more uh, negatively oriented like this one, the terrorist killed the cannibal. Th this is just an example, a toy, uh, toy sentence because they were longer. But the idea was that all the content words in the sentence had a negative uh, value, okay? So that in the negative condition, in the neutral condition, it was about the dog and the table and I mean, neutral things. And we have people reading uh, and rating them in the foreign and in the native language. Uh, the rating was very easy. The rating is uh, how impactful you think it is. Uh, and this is from uh, one to nine in a classic Likert-like scale. Uh, results, the negative sentences were negative, negatively evaluated as compared to the neutral ones that were neutral. Fine, we knew that ahead, right? But simply the results confirmed that. Curiously, they, do, they did understand everything and there was no difference between the language A and language B in terms of the, the scores they gave in this emotional judgment, okay? So there was nothing telling us that the impact was different depending on the language except for the psychophysiological responses, because we were collecting, in this case, uh, the, the, the pupil dilation. So you, you simply put the eye tracker on and, and you check how wide or how big the, the pupil is uh, with each sentence. Here you have a um, basic, basic chart showing you that in the foreign language, uh, the negative was not that negative and the, and the neutral was not that neutral either. So the, the difference between one and the other was smaller as compared to the native language, which, which would be the baseline, so to say, right? So from here, what we can see is that the negative is less negative and the, the neutral is even less neutral. Hmm? Because of, probably because of the general cost of speaking or understanding a foreign language together with other processes. But the thing is that easy sentences that were understood by everyone and that were rated as equally negative or neutral in the two languages, when you check what your body is doing, your body is reacting differently to one and the other. Yeah? So this is a foreign language effect per se. Automatic because you cannot control it. Actually, when you think twice, when you are asked to give a response, your response is identical in the native and in the foreign language. I promised you a picture. <laughs> it will come, Jason, a picture. Uh, joy because, you know what, this is, one, another misery of the, of the human being, we like seeing ourselves represented in things. It's not, it's not the same as seeing a picture of yourself. 
but knowing that you took part in something. We are so egocentrist that, that research has consistently shown that when we are represented in here and there and we are presented with those elements, there's a feeling of, hey, yeah, it was me. <laughs> really? I mean, uh, yeah, because we like seeing ourselves represented in things. We'll stop. How, how do we know this? So this all started with, with very basic, uh, and really this is a paradigm which is extremely basic you could replicate this with a master's student and and it will work mm -hmm. so the first step is imagine that you have three geometric figures like the triangle the circle and the square and three letters a b c and you assign one to one randomly i mean whatever okay uh mm -hmm. and in the in the experimental setting you're going to be presented with one figure and one letter and your task is super easy you only need to tell me whether they match or not according to what you learned. I mean, there are three things, so you should be able to learn them and remember them. And you have trial after trial. And in some cases, you see that they do match. So yes, it was the, the A with the triangle, the B with the circle, and, and the square with the C. In some other cases, the answer is no, right? So you play this game for five minutes, full stop. Do you expect any difference depending on the type of assignment here? And, and I told you that it was done at random. So if someone wants to say that the A looks like the triangle, imagine that in your case, the A goes with the circle. I mean, the three could be quadrant. Uh, right, then I, to, to you, you will receive the triangle with the, with the C. Okay. The idea is that, I mean, to me, it's equally relevant, the A with the circle and whatever, right? But now the picture. <laughs> And, and this is an experiment, okay? This is a real experiment. Um, uh, it, it's called the self-effect. <laughs> so uh, imagine that in the learning scenario, you, you are presented with one geometric figure and they tell you, you know what? This is you, okay? And they use a picture of you uh, or, or they tell you that this is you. And then they give you a different figure and they tell you, this is a friend of you, okay? The one in the middle is the friend. And then you have the, the third condition in which it's um, a foreigner. It is the other condition. Uh, just for you to know that person, uh, if you Google for this person does not exist, uh, there's, there is a web that automatically creates pictures of, uh, it's made by Google, I think. It, it, it's uh, artificial intelligence getting pictures from here and there and mixing them. And they give you pictures of person that look like a real person, but that person does not exist, okay? So you can, you can later on search for this. Uh, okay, so you think that this is the scenario and then the, the experiment is super easy. This is the experiment. Again, this, the same experiment as with the letters, but now with you being represented there or a friend of you, or uh, an unknown person, the other person. In some cases, you need to say yes. In some others, you need to say no. And now we get all the yes responses. So the ones in green, trial after trial. And the question is, do you expect any difference here? Yeah. Which one is the difference? Will be. Uh, way more emphasis on A and less way Okay, more attention to the one in which you are represented, you would say. And, and what would attention imply in this behavioral context of responding uh, to the stimuli? It becomes a mirror. It becomes faster. You react to this much faster because your attention has been oriented there, because you have been represented in the picture. If uh, you were there as compared to a condition, of uh, the, the, the foreigner, right? In which the reaction time is maximal. And then the friend is in the middle. The friend, the friend is a friend of you, so it's part of you, but it's not you. So it's always, a, you, you can actually test friendship this way. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, it has been also explored using MRI, uh, and we know at the moment that the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, which is, a, well, uh, a network uh, we, that, that, that uh, talks about emotions in a way, uh, reacts pretty much to the first case, not that much to the second case, uh, not at all with the third one. Okay, so this is a self-effect which is based on the activation of some emotionally uh, relevant aspects of you. This has been done also with linguistic stimuli. This has been done by simply changing the picture of you 
for the word you and then friend and other. And the results are exactly the same. You saw a self preference effect if the word you has been pasted together with one of the figures because you read you and you think of yourself being represented there. So that's how the human mind works. Okay. So we are strange. Fine. Can you imagine the experiment? This, this is something that was already done. Nothing to do with bilingualism. Let's test them in two languages, in the native and in the foreign language, as easy as that. So that's what we did. You, you have exactly the same setting and you get tu, amigo, otro. Those are you, friend, other in Spanish. Uh, and if they are native Spanish speakers with uh, relatively good command of English, then you use the, the English version too, you, other, uh, and friend, and check what happens. So you have these two groups. The other group is the group who's a native Spanish speaker doing it in Spanish. And this last group here is native English speakers doing it in English. Unless they are, for some unknown reason, cultural differences between one and the other that there are. But if they do not affect the self effect per se, uh, we should find the same results here and there. There's no good reason for, for the Spaniards being more egocentrist, if you want, than, than the Brits would be the opposite whatever we have we, we have the critical group which is a group of native spanish speakers who know some english too and these guys did it in english okay fine results i focus on the self-effect because the friend is the one in the middle and and it makes things much more complicated but think of the extremes you versus the other okay uh, in the case of the native Spanish speakers uh, doing this in Spanish, there was a healthy self-effect of, of uh, more than 100 milliseconds. And this is a super fast task uh, that gives you something like uh, 400 milliseconds, 500 milliseconds of reaction times. So this means this is a huge effect, okay? Now you get the, the, the English people doing this in English and you get 124 milliseconds, pretty much alike. So no surprise. And you get these guys and you only get 50 milliseconds of the effect. Yeah, it is significant. The still there is a self uh, prioritization effect in the, uh, in the foreign language, but it's much smaller. Yeah, uh, this, was done, this was done first between groups. So a group of Spanish people doing this in Spanish and a group of Spanish English bilinguals doing this in English. And then we did it within person too. So we had people doing this Spanish, English bilinguals doing this in, in the two languages and we replicated the effect, okay? So don't think that is due to the properties of the different samples, but rather it has to do with, with what's going on with uh, these guys. Now, again, if you remember what happened with the killer and the assassin, it was that the negative was not that negative and that the neutral was not that neutral. Uh, there is something similar going on here. So the other is not that far away from me and me, I am not that much represented here when tested in the foreign language. Okay. So it's not one of them. So in the difference is, is, is the, the magnitude of the difference that, that gives you this 54 millisecond uh, effect, but the two things vary. Sorry. It was randomized. So it, it, it was within the same experiment. Uh, the items could come either in Spanish or it was fully, yeah. It, it, yeah. So because if, if we went for a block design, then it, it would be very much alike the, the other thing. No, no, we, we did it like within, within. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Uh, I'll tell you about this yeah. in a second. Yeah, sorry. Perfect. Uh, so it's, it's not that much about you, it's about the others. So it's, it's simply that the proximity of, so, or, <laughs> Yeah, proximity, I don't know. 
the distance is measured different. And, and there are some experiments from Guillaume Thierry recently also showing that distance is, uh, so the mental distance between persons is, is measured differently depending on the language that you use. So, so apparently there is something behind. Well, we, we had a, a question after seeing this because this tells you that there is something going on, but um, and now putting the debate back to, to the corresponding arena, is this foreign, is, is this non-native, is because of my command of English, what's going on here? We didn't know, right? So what's the locus of the effect? And it can be because the English was a foreign language for our Spanish English bilinguals, or because it was a non-native uh, language, or because of the two of things happening together, or uh, simply it was a mistake, <laughs> you know, you repeat the experiment and you don't replicate that. Uh, it was worth uh, going further, so we, we did this next series of experiments on this. And, and remember, we were testing, in this case, they were Spanish speakers uh, from, from San Sebastián, Donostia, uh, where also Basque is spoken uh, sometimes. Uh, and then the English we got, they were English people who were living in Donostia, uh, despite being born in in, in UK, so um, we we needed to do something different. And for this to be done, we we knew that there was a non-native but not foreign language for these guys too, which can be Basque. So we got people who were native Spanish speakers and who had a very high command both in Basque and English, and pretty much similar age of acquisition because all of them uh, started learning the language, the, the, the non-native languages uh, at the age of four to six, okay? Uh, and they did not speak English or Basque in the family context and so on. So it was only mainly uh, three linguals with, with the Spanish as the strong language and then two other languages, one being foreign English and one being contextually present, which was uh, Basque. If you find the same effect for Basque and Spanish, it is because of the foreign nature of the, of, of the English language then. If you find the same for Basque and English, then it's not because of the foreign conception of the language, but simply due to the fact, maybe, that it is not a native language. And whatever is not a native language will show that difference. Okay, so I'm going to present only the self and the other uh, to make things a bit easier. Self-effect. Uh, for these trilinguals in the native language Spanish, 110 milliseconds effect, yeah? In the non-native but contextually present language, English, uh, sorry, Basque, yeah? 111 milliseconds, virtually the same. Now you go to English, and this is within persons, okay? Uh, 77 milliseconds, significantly different from the others, yeah? So it seems that it has to do with the fact that uh, it is, um, sorry, a foreign language. Yeah, because we can replicate this with Basque, still uh, having a pretty much the same proficiency in, in Basque and, and English. Uh, so the answer is that the foreign language effects are due to the foreign nature of them. Well, <laughs> yeah, that's why they are called foreign language effects. Yeah, but this does not mean that all that you will read in the literature on foreign language effects is done with foreign languages. Again, because you will find people running Spanish Basque bilinguals, for instance, and talking about foreign language effects in the Basque country. In the Basque country, Basque cannot be foreign. Mm -hmm. Can be relatively foreign to you or your family, but not to the macro context, social context, right? But whatever, yeah. And, and I will uh, end this part with uh, fear. So the last character, uh, and, and this is a very promising line of research that we started some time ago and that we are about to publish a new paper on this because it is really curious. Um, if you are psychologists, you know about uh, fear a lot because this is a clinical condition that it's treated in therapy and, and that we uh, psychologists know how to deal with it pretty well, but in real life, in, in our daily life, we don't know how to deal with fear, <laughs> okay? Fear instruction is, is, is super, super, super pervasive. Um, I, the, the best example is whenever someone tells you that if you don't do something, something bad will happen to you. And, and this is threatening and this is fear instruction, yeah? Uh, we have been... Well, in different, no, this is a philosophical conversation for later on, but fear instruction has been behind of, of, of many of the social miseries that, that we've been living in the last uh, decades uh, because uh, some social groups were not empowered. 
right? So empowering means uh, leaving aside uh, this fear instruction because some other person has decided to instruct you in that fear. Okay, so but that that's that's uh, I, I can tell you that something will be harmful for you and you will react with fear to that stimuli. Okay, that can happen simply by me verbally telling you that something can happen. And the way it works in experimental settings with verbal instruction of fear, which is amazing, it works super nice. It's you get a participant, you put it in the in the lab, and you know that we have a lot of uh, cables and, and electrodes in the labs for different purposes, right? But so you, you take some of the electrodes and you stick them to the wrist and, and, and you put the cable going down there and you tell the participant, you know what? From time to time, you can get a shock. It's going to be painful, but you can handle it, but it's going to be painful, huh? <laughs> but you can handle it. Of course, here you have the, the informed consent. If you want to leave, you can leave now, <laughs> but if you stay, remember, it will be painful, <laughs> right? The thing is that this electrode is an electrode that you use for different purposes and that you stick there and there, it's not connected to anything, but they don't know. And the, the fun thing of this is that you put the, the participant in this, uh, fear context and you tell the participant that uh, the, uh, he or she has to complete a very 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 easy task a task in which you need to count backwards if you see a, a square okay so uh, you, you see the square and then you need to say 10 9 8 7 6 5 4 3 1 and the next one appears super easy super easy uh, but i tell you that if the square is let's say yellow you can get the sock if the square is blue nothing will happen and during the experimental session that will last for 15 or 20 minutes you may get three to five socks fine as long as you are sitting there and you decide to keep on doing the experiment you know what's going to happen right uh you you get information about the the, the psychophysiological reaction of the person and, and and to do this i go back to the measures that i mentioned like the pupil dilation and the electrodermal activity the galvanic skin response and even the heart rate whenever we see uh this type of uh yellow is uh, squares our body reacts our mind uh, blows uh, and then i start sweating uh, my pupils dilate i mean I, I i am afraid because something bad can happen to me yeah even though Along the course of the experiment, nothing happens, nothing happens, nothing happens. You know that it's one minute left and you, instead of thinking, wow, this was not true. Do you know what they think when you debrief them? They will come all together at the end. <laughs> <laughs> and you're with a cable like, yes, sure. <laughs> funny thing, funny thing, you, in the debrief, if you ask them about what they felt, many say, yeah, I felt it, but it was not that painful. <laughs> really? You felt it? Up to you. No, 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 really, try this with the students. It's, it's amazing. So the thing is that nothing, nothing will happen. Nothing happens, but we react as if something were to happen. Okay? Only in the condition in which we have been uh, experimentally manipulated to show fear, a fear response. Fantastic. This is something... Sorry. raised and in our society but i think we have such experience with like consequences out of fear and that is just so interesting as well right that we are so skillful at like being attentive to the punishment well i mean if my mom takes the the flip-flop yeah. i know what's going to happen you don't you don't know to explain me that i did something wrong because the next step is uh, me crying probably so yeah, but but that simply that movement makes everything change. Yeah, we, we live in that type of, of uh, life. Yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, that's why we have uh, traffic lights and other things, because we, we need to be afraid of things, because if, if there are not signals, uh, we don't react properly. <laughs> that's another misery. Well, can you imagine the experiment we did? 
you make them count backwards in English or in Spanish. In this case, they were Spanish native speakers with English as a foreign language as before. Uh, and they only needed to say uh, 10, 9, 8 or, or 10, 9, 8. That, that was it, okay? So some people did it in the native language, some others did it in the foreign language. And of course the colors were counterbalanced and all these things. And we were collecting the psychophysiological responses of people, uh, both the, the pupil dilation and the galvanic skin response. So this, um, Electrodermal activity. Okay. Um, sorry for the graphs. I, I, I hate putting data per se, but uh, well, what, what you find, and trust me, is that the magnitude of the fear conditioning is smaller, is reduced in the foreign language as compared to the native language. Okay. Both in one and the other type of responses. Uh, so so the, 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 my automatic response to this uh, conditioned fear is different in the, in the native and in the foreign language. Yeah, and the only English that was involved here was my 10, 9, 8, blah, blah. As in the other case, the only English that was involved was you, friend, other. Three words. So with that, you can create a linguistic context that can make things change. Amazing. Do you know somehow um, also like the accuracy of how they responded or the words? We collected the the, 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 the the we have the voice recordings of the of the ten na 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 uh, because we were analyzing the tremor and these things like the, the purely vocal uh, things yeah yeah. Did that interact at all? Like how well they were able to basically stay on task and how scared they were? Oh, what we found it was the fear effect in both cases, but we didn't analyze the the interaction between the languages and things. No, we we just wanted because this was like a really post hoc thing just to make sure that uh, the, the, the vocal tremor existed and it existed so in that, that fear was there. I mean, actually fear is here. So you, you can easily see that there is a fear condition. And the cool thing of this uh, is that we, we have now finished another line of experiments another series in which participants, so, so imagine that you're a clinical psychologist, okay? And uh, can you use this for something? And the answer is yes. Because if there is emotional uh, detachment in the foreign language, if fear is felt differently in uh, the foreign language, maybe the foreign language can be useful for therapy. Mm -hmm. Because if there is post-traumatic stress disorder, if there is something happening in a given specific situation in which you cannot talk about in a given language, why not create in a different linguistic context in which you may maybe less afraid of or, or your emotional impact, the emotional impact of the situation will be reduced, right? And, and what we have done now is, is uh, trying to analyze extinction. Extinction is the other side of this coin. So this is creating fear. And then at some point I can tell you, you know what? Ah, it was fake. Don't worry. You will not receive any shock, right? And then extinction starts. Because from that moment on, you will react equally to, to the blue and to the, to the yellow uh, conditions. Yeah. So we, we did an experiment in which participants were fear instructed in the native language. And, and then we had like big groups of, of people really being afraid of the, let's say, yellow square. And suddenly we, we told them either in one language or in the other, so English or uh, Spanish, nothing will happen. Keep on doing this, but you will not receive any shock. And we found the same. Um, the, the, the same reduction of the fear conditioning effect across time. So you can eventually use therapy in a foreign language and get to the same extinction effects. Yeah. And that's what we are trying to do now in the real world. So going to, to a clinical psychologist and, and uh, asking them to do this. By the way, if you have the chance, Freud uh, already wrote about these things a long time ago. Uh, because he had patients who were native German speakers or native English speakers, and he reacted to them. He didn't know how to do it, but he decided to do that using the foreign language as a tool. And there, there are some things written by him that, that apparently point in this same direction. So foreign languages uh, elicit emotional distance. They are so pervasive that they can even alter some automatic reactions of my mind thus body. And they exist because they are they are foreign nature, not because of their non-native uh, nature. So that means that we should not keep on 
teaching languages the way we have, if we think or if we decide that these effects of a foreign language effects are not desirable. So if we agree that that's weird, that's strange, let's change it. And if we want to change it, the, we should find a way. And probably the way is by experiencing different uh, things with this foreign language and making it non-native and not foreign. I will get to this in a second. So language and emotions in the native language, they are very tight, not that tight in the foreign language. There is a way, there is a way to kind of uh, counteract this by uh, treating foreign languages as much as we can, as we do treat native languages. And this is the solution for the monster, okay? So how can we deal with this monster that we have? Because the foreign languages, we have them. So in, in school, in the school system, we mandatorily need to have, uh, according to the European Commission, two foreign languages, yeah? Uh, how, how to deal with this is not easy. First, we need to think of inclusion instead of integration. Integration is very easy. It's a concept in which you put something in and that's it. <laughs> you have integrated it, okay? Inclusion is much more complicated because inclusion needs to understand that, that the system is dynamic and that whenever you put something in a system, the system has changed, evolved, okay? So there's going to be interaction between the different elements of the system. That's inclusion. So it's not putting a person with a wheelchair in a corner. That's not inclusion. That's integration. Okay. No, really, I mean, really. We've played the integration game thing in Spain, thinking that we were super advanced. And, and you go to places now and you see that that it's simply another type of discrimination. Simply, right? Um, well, you know that whenever you change uh, language, there is a switch cost, right? Cannot be easy for my mind to start naming things suddenly in English and suddenly in Spanish and then again in English and then again in Spanish. That, that, that necessarily should imply a cost, but a cost that we are able to, to solve with relative decency. So I could say, perro, house, lapis, plane, manzana, survived. Well, yeah, but you took longer one. Yes, yes, yeah, I took longer, but yeah, I did it. Okay, so I, I was able to communicate in this language mixing uh, scenario. And if you know my two languages and I know your two languages, we do know the same two languages. So why can't we speak in any of them whenever we want? And this is the basics of something that in the school context is understood as translanguaging, which is the it has different definitions, but uh, in the bottom line, it tells you that if a language can be used as means of communication, you can use it. So if it is a valid means for communication, it can be used. Yeah. So there's no forbidden language. And maybe it's time for, for some of us, in the, in, especially in, in communities with more than one language, like actively co-officially present, to understand that there is no forbidden language, not one nor the other, not the majority, not the minority language. Uh, in, I, I'm going to try to convince you that mixing is not bad, okay? This is the classic scenario in which you test participants in a naming setting in which switching, language switching will occur. So you have a first block in which you present different objects to the person and the, the person needs to name the elements. So in this case, uh, the person would say dog and then house and then uh, apple, fantastic. And you will do the same in the other language in a different block. And then it comes to the dual language uh, context or setting in which there will, you will have a queue, be it a, a color or a flag or whatever. And depending on the queue, you will name the element in either one language or the other. That's the, the classic uh, language switching uh, paradigm, okay? Uh, so here you will switch from English to Spanish saying like house manzana. Yeah, and that implies a cost. That's what we call the switching cost that can be measured in multiple terms, but the, the easiest way to, to, to get it is by calculating the time taken to start producing each word. And, and there's uh, an, uh, an additional set of milliseconds that you need to reconfigure and adapt to the new uh, articulatory system, blah, 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 and switch, fine. But there's also a mixing cost here. E typically in the literature, if you take all the, the, the time you need 
to name the elements in a single language scenario versus the dual language scenario, you speak faster. So you name things faster if they come in the same language uh, than if they come with flags telling you different languages. Okay, so the switching cost in this context comes also with a mixing cost. That's that has been replicated really tons of times. Uh, what we did uh, some time ago, it was uh, giving them the option to voluntarily switch. Instead of us telling them that they had to switch, we first did the single language block, and then in the dual language block, we asked them. We told them, if you want to use any of the languages to name this element, you can. Uh, we have done this with English and we have done this also with Basque and Spanish. And in, in America, it has been done with native, Span native uh, English speakers, uh, American English speakers uh, who knew some Spanish too. So uh, essentially, you would expect, um, this is what we expected, not those many switches because we thought at the beginning that you were going to stick to a single language. I mean, why should I be moving, jumping from one to the other? And that was our only hypothesis. The rest was exploratory. Results. Bilinguals switch nearly half of the time. We didn't, I didn't expect this. That, that was my first surprise. But it comes uh, together with, with some, so it's aligned with, with results from, from America and other places. So apparently we, we like switching if we are given the chance to do that. So we don't see any problem in switching. Uh, so, and then we, well, we do it. 40% of the trials, this is almost switching one out of two. So that means switching all the time. Yeah. There is a switching cost. I need to reconfigure myself. Uh, and the articulatory system is different and uh, I need to inhibit other different types of competitors. So whenever I switch from one language to the other, be it voluntary or not, there is a switching cost. But the most interesting thing here, it's the mixing benefit instead of mixing cost. If you take all the time needed to complete the single language or the voluntary dual language uh, context, despite the fact that there is a cost, Overall, you speak faster. So that apparently should be better if you are able to communicate things faster, despite the cognitive cost of switching, why not promoting this, right? So there is no, there is a cost, which is the cost of moving from one thing to the other. So changing your mental schema, we knew that. So if you are doing this and suddenly you change to this, there is a cost in time for sure, yeah? But the benefit is that overall you speak faster because you are better able to come with the names. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, then we have several papers understanding this, checking whether the, the different um, properties of the items and of the individuals uh, were modulating this. The answer is no, this is generalized effect. Okay. So maybe it's time to, to start breaking the educational rules that some others had imposed for quite a long time. And this uh, links back to the way we have been taught languages, at least I have been taught languages uh, in the schools I've been attending to. One of these uh, classic rules is the, the one subject, one language uh, rule, in which if you have different subjects, this rule said or says that uh, they can be in one language and this language can be different from the one happening before or after, but you should not mix languages within, within the same subject context because that will be harmful for God knows what, yeah? Uh, we have four, pa five papers now showing that this is, uh, sorry, all crap. This is not grounded. This is not scientifically valid. This is based on tradition and a tradition that was uh, originated by God knows who and when, no idea. But there is no educational or scientific, psychological, neuropsychological foundation for this, sorry. You learn the same. Probably, probably. But we, we really, because when, when we started doing this, I was concerned about people really learning. Because if you see a drawback, then, then language mixing should only be promoted as long as it works fine for everything. And, and it, it, we didn't find any uh, negative effect or harmful effect of mixing languages for word learning, content learning, content association between different subjects and so on and so on. 
Second rule, which is also super strange, is the one person, one language rule. This rule essentially tells you that the persons can teach you or can speak to you in just one language, but not in two languages, because that's not natural or whatever. I don't know. Yeah. And that's that's weird. And that that today, at least in my near context, gives you some strange experiences like a kid who's five, six, seven years old, going on the street, finding Lucy, the English teacher, and Lucy is asking for a wine or for a loaf of bread in Spanish, in the perfect Spanish. And then the kid says, oh, she speaks Spanish. And then you think, well, Lucy has been living here. Lu Lucy is called Lucia, first. <laughs> Second, Lucy has been living here forever and ever. And third, the, the baker does not know English. So, yeah, but, but the kid thinks that that person cannot speak that language because they have been taught that a person speaks one language. How not? That doesn't make any sense in a multilingual world. If it is a multilingual world, it's, it's full of multilingual persons. Right? So, put it differently, it's not the same as sequence as a school with a sequence of monolingualisms than a real bilingual school context in which languages can, well, interact. Easy. And if languages interact, it's because the persons also interact with the languages. And the same person can speak different languages. Why not? And penalizing a person for using one language is, well, strange. Yeah. So let me end with a positive uh, note that summarizes all the foreign language effects. And, and really, Nelson Mandela apparently said this, uh, and he was right. Uh, if you talk to a man, uh, to a person in a language that that person understands, uh, that will go to, to this person's head. If you talk to that person in his or her language, then that will go to his or her heart. And it's true. I mean, the emotional reaction we will have to a language depends on the qualification or classification of the language. And we don't want that for sure. So maybe it's time to, to rethink of uh, how we teach languages. And maybe this is time to start moving aside or moving uh, far from, from the concept of foreign language instruction, which per se gives you some strange effects. So thank you so much. And thank you also to all these people and more people that, that have occupied me during this long journey on foreign languages. Thanks. I heard two hours and I was, I heard two hours before, so that's why I was slow. Yeah, no, Is no, it no, fine? No, okay, yeah, definitely yeah. be in time for the rest time. Perfect, time. perfect. Yeah. 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 So, okay, so it's foreign not nativeness. Let me, let me ask you this. Have you thought about or are there relevant studies when your language, so you Nelson Mandela's term, becomes a foreign language in your context. So I'm thinking about Hispanics who move to the United States. Uh, they don't live in the middle of Los Angeles, but they live in the middle of Iowa, and they've been there for 30 years, but they were 30 when they got there. So now their language is a foreign language. Would you expect some change here or not? Yes, it changes. So you it expect changed. them to look like in their first language, that which is a foreign language effect. For instance, for, for heritage uh, speakers, I would expect them in the majority language to show native-like effects and in the home language to show foreign language-like effects in the self uh, paradigm, for instance. Yeah. For their parents, I don't know. It's worth testing. For, for the kids, I understand that the, the majority language in which they will uh, be immersed in the school system and so on, that will make everything change. But for the father and mother, in terms of translation, processing and things like those, it has been shown a switch, a proficiency-like switch. I don't know whether it would be that deep as the type of effects that I'm presenting here, because 
these these are not based on on lexical processing and things like that. These are more psycho psychological, if you wish, but it's worth testing. So I would really love to to run these self paradigm things with with uh, these type of different contexts because, sorry. Uh, I'll, I'll go fast. I, I promise you something that I didn't do. In the second uh, series of, of uh, self uh, paradigm experiment, uh, what we did it was collecting plenty of measures about the language use, proficiency, context, and so on, trying to understand if uh, any of them could predict the magnitude of the of the self effect or the differences between languages. And we were unable, completely unable, to show anything. No significant correlation. And at the very end, we thought. Well, maybe this per se, this paradigm is a test of that. It's, it's a test of acculturation. So we are proposing to use this to measure how close or far away you feel or you react to a language. That's interesting, right? Because acculturation also means something different depending on the minority or racialized group you're in and the context you're in. So this is also interesting in itself. And following up on Jason's uh, question or comment, uh, I think something very interesting would be at the same time that. Uh, but like there, there is a generation of Hispanic immigrants in the US that were physically punished for using Spanish uh, or any other minority language in, in school, right? So there, there must be some form of, I don't know if I would say PTSD uh, trauma response to, to the language, but I wonder whether that history of trauma might be related to the way in which you also react to using your language because how much time do we have in minutes well let's say we have to finish at, at 420. sorry no, what, what? 25 minutes. 20 minutes. okay 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 then then yeah. i will give you an answer <laughs> <laughs> when i saw this i immediately moved to that field of punishment or hate or love to something because some people did this with the with the logos of the football team, the same paradigm, and and they found like funny effects. So you love this team and you hate the other. I did this with independentists uh, from the Basque country, and then the Basque flag, the Spanish flag, and then the I don't know. I think it was the Rwanda flag. Mm -hmm. So like the other, yeah. And we found the anti-self effect. So instead of one being in the middle of the other and the you, you being, let's say, the Basque flag, instead of Spanish being there, Spanish was the last one. Mm -hmm. It was even worse than the other. So call it hate, call it uh, detachment, call it whatever, whatever. For some people, you can find that a language can, can be farther away than an unknown event, simply because of that. Yeah, yeah but this is so interesting related to the process of acculturation, right? And especially looking at my, minoritized and racialized languages, because the context pushes you to reject who you are, and it's the other way to stimulate. Mm -hmm. Because then, again, this is a simulation with not real acculturation, as you said very well. Yeah, yeah. Um, then I think this is fascinating, and may, may give some like scientific grounds to actually say we need to stop doing things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <interesting. laughs> Thanks. So first off, really great talk. Um, I actually want to change directions a bit and follow up on the language mixing effects you were talking about. So that was really cool. Um, you mentioned a bit that you couldn't see you know, an effect of learning as well. So it's like language mixing seemed to apply regardless of the stage you're at. Did you happen to look at usage patterns? I had this inclination just off the, you know, the top of my head that there might, might be a threshold at which there might need to be a minimal level of use for that to apply mm -hmm. just for you know, the relative activation computer. So that may not be true. Maybe you didn't see that. If you mean previous use or or contemporary use but outside the classroom, yeah. uh, uh, wait, because in the experimental context, uh, all our manipulations were were 50% in one language, 50 in the other, versus all in one language. Right. Okay, uh, so I cannot experimentally solve this, but uh, there are some studies by uh, Baker and others in uh, Wells, uh, in which they, they had the minority language that was also not known by the students, so the use of the language was reduced, so, so it was there, but they didn't know that much. And what they what they found is that learning was uh, pretty much the same for the two languages, and also language development 
was equally good for the two languages. I would like to, to replicate those things with more experimentally controlled settings. But apparently, uh, even if you have a low command and low exposure to that language, language mixing is not that bad. And essentially, this, uh, this brings back to the principle of the native language as a helper, as a, as a door opener for you. So because there is an emotional attachment to the native language, so everything, so all these uh, foreign language anxiety effects that we know about, we, we, we can forget about them if we simply open windows to the, to the native language. If you start talking to me now in, in English, you give me a rest. Sorry, in Spanish, you give me a rest. No, that, so that, that would be helpful for a person who is not uh, speaking the, the majority language. But if you're uh, if you're sort of equally proficient in both language. In my personal experience, staying on that language, one of the languages is more costly. For example, if I want to speak to my grandmother, uh -huh. who doesn't know English, it's more costly for me than switching. Is it clear? So if I speak with a person, a a Persian speaker, for example, who knows English well, and I keep switching back and forth between my languages, it's the easiest way of communication. Okay. But if I want to stay on one language, it's more costly. Really? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the, 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 the data seem to say that too, but still we... Okay, I, li I live in a bilingual community in which uh, me and my family, we are used to switch languages constantly. Yeah, yeah. Except with the kids. Mm. To them, we speak only in Basque. Okay? I don't feel that, that pain mm -hmm. of not having the chance to switch. Mm -hmm. We do that relatively naturally. Yeah. Okay? But it's true that we are talking about costs and efforts that are measured in terms of milliseconds. So it's mm -hmm. also normal that I don't feel that pain. Still, still, you can have a hard uh, headache if you spend the whole day speaking a foreign language. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean. Mm -hmm. so, okay, given your research, why do you only speak fast to your children? <laughs> that that's no 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 that that's that's the question that's it's it's obvious it's it's the the first time that that someone comes with that question and this is simply due to promote Basque. It's 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 more a cultural thing than a linguistic or communicative thing. It's because I want it to stay alive in my in my close uh, family context. Yeah, and so that they know or they, they develop attachment to the language and to the family. Mm -hmm. They have grandpa speaking in Spanish or grandma speaking in Spanish, no, no worries with that. And they hear mommy and daddy uh, having a discussion in, in Spanish. So that, that's fine, right? But, but they I want them to, to develop this attachment to the language together with the love that they will eventually have to mom and dad. <laughs> I was actually thinking of that question before because I, I was thinking if there were if there were no political issues, imagine we in a world where we were completely free. Hypothetically, okay. um, do you think you would have a different um, relationship with? I mean, in that your kids would still be equally exposed or maybe differentially exposed to Basque and Spanish, but there wouldn't be a societal imposition that they coming from certain parts of society that they need to all these things are Danish or all these things are Gabriel that would say something about who they are. Do you think if there was not that pressure, you would uh, maybe think or I would love to see what happens. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know but what I know is that the way we've kept languages in my society is not the correct one. Because it was not inclusive. Right. It is not inclusive. Mm -hmm. Still, I send my kids to a Basque speaking school, but I sell the idea of the bilingual school or the multilingual school as the aim. But given that they are not doing things as we would like them to do, I need to make a choice because the bilingual mode is a, sequential, is a, a sequence of, of multi monolingualism. So really it's not purely bilingual. Therefore, I need to 
choose among the, the one of the bad options. <laughs> Sure. For, for this to be done, we need to define academic achievement first, because if you test them with the materials that they have learned, that's what we did in our experiments, uh, you, you get to the same end. So similar achievement. Then we know that with mathematics, this is not the case because they're, I mean, calculus, basic calculus uh, is grounded on a language, not two languages so far, probably because of the way we teach languages too. But, but we know that for math, this is really important. So uh, decisions should be made. And uh, also that socioeconomic differences between the regions uh, play the huge role. So it, it is virtually impossible to compare a bilingual context like the Basque country and, and let's say Madrid, because we are different societies uh, with, with the idiosyncrasies of the societies and the money that ones have and the others not or so on. So it, it is difficult to come with an answer to that. I would say that at least from the experimental data, if you would test me with the same things that you taught me, no difference, but only, only in this context. Uh, uh, can you speculate a bit like on you know, the mechanisms underlying this effect? Like when you see that there's, you know, there is an effect but your thoughts on like what's going on? Let's say just for the like the, the chance problem. So which effect? Um, the foreign language effect. So the, the big box of foreign language effects. Yeah, uh, but, you know, your thoughts. Like, to me, it's right. it's a convolution of first the, the the cognitive effort involved in speaking or processing a non-native language, and that being non-native. So I'm not that familiar. My proficiency level is lower. I have all my resources put on that. Uh, I have to inhibit my native language languages. That's a pain on the neck. So, so that's, that's costly. Then the second thing is that uh, my approach to this is, is uh, the glottic in essence, because I have learned this language for being used in this context. And I'm using English here, but I'm pretty sure that I will not speak English outside the professional context uh, for some months, right? So that, that creates differences. Uh, and the way I have been taught the languages too is different. So altogether, to me, and the availability of resources in one and the other language, and why should I listen to the radio in 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 English? I mean, pff, that that that's strange. Uh, I, I switch TV on in Spanish, in Spain, and everything is in Spanish. Not even subtitles. Nothing. Everything is stopped. Everything. I don't know what's the voice of I uh, know oh Jack Nicholson, because in my case, the the Al Pacino and Jack Nicholson have the same voice. <laughs> Can you imagine that? Because you know the real voice, eh? Can you imagine? <laughs> so altogether, that that gives you a society that is not promoting pure multilingualism or. Oh, but I mean, you know, like, okay, like, you hear this chance problem. The, the oh yeah. Language, like, in in uh, English, uh, like, what happens when you have like you know the language triggers you? To, uh, some mind? people. Some people link this to Kahneman's uh, system one, system two decision making. Okay. It's the way we make decision that could be either very rational or, or thoughtful or slow, or then the, the passional, intuitive uh, system, which is the fast. Uh, I think that his, his main work was uh, think fast. Think fast and slow. 
yeah, think fast, think slow, or, or something like that, right? It's simply because there are two systems, one which is like the, the, the way you can imagine things, you count in numbers, uh, and then the other, which is like the gut response, yeah? If it is in the native language, you give the gut response. Mm -hmm. If it is in the foreign language, you are in this work mode, and then you calculate better. Actually, I don't know whether you know, but, but in risk calculation, risk calculation is done much better, much more accurately if it is done in the foreign language than if it is done in the native language. And that's why many companies nowadays uh, promote in, in Spain, for instance, the, um, uh, that at the executive level, they deal uh, with the issues in either English or German, but not in Spanish, being Spanish their native language. Because you, you it's a divorce thing. So it's the same, you, you are going to solve the issue faster. Uh, uh, numerically speaking, remember that uh, the lives to be saved in the in the trolley dilemma were the same in the two contexts, five and one. A computer would have done the same, the same, because you are saving the same number of lives, yeah? But we are not computers. However, if, if this is useful for your situation, because this is about finance or, or business, then I may set you in this context and then you will make better numbers. So, so something really interesting to what you're saying is that is it because now we're thinking about you know there was the attenuation effect with the bank, right? But then we had the foreign context of it. What if people who are now being pushed to do this like risk calculations in English or German? Um, what would would there be an effect of habituation? So meaning that experience of taking a oh. risk a decision in a different language will you eventually somehow? Depend, um, depending on whether you got in love with the secretary or not. And understand me correctly here. If it is just about work and numbers, you are still at that level of, of the foreign language. But whenever you start developing some sort of, of links with the language and in the language, different uh, experiences, vital experiences, then maybe the foreign language is less foreign to you. Right, but 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 this need to happen. If this doesn't happen, then you're still working in a foreign language for for given reasons. But if you start developing bonds to, with the other person in that uh, other persons in in that language, then I mean I cannot say that a friend of mine who with I only speak in English is less friend than a friend of mine who speaks in Spanish with me. I couldn't say that. Is, is there a response from the trade off, right? Because if this is linked to system one and system two, right, then the real difference here is you have involuntary emotional, so fast, and it should be faster in your native language. And if it's system two, then you just get more deliberate, slower, rational, logical. It's more pragmatic, right? You're mm -hmm. making more pragmatic decision, but there then should be a time trade off. Is, is there a reaction? There is. There is. There is always a foreign language effect despite the conditions. Yes, yes. Uh, because of the, the multiple processes that you need to do in, in the foreign language, obviously. I mean, it is not easy. Speaking in a foreign language is not easy. And how we need to realize about these things. Then it shows you other strange effects with conditions, but per se, there is a foreign language effect that affects all of us. I remember when uh, Trump was going to meet with the North Korea president. Do you guys remember mm -hmm. uh, they were they, every, there was a discussion about uh, what language they should speak, right? Mm -hmm. um, and whether the interpreters should be the speakers or not, because I think someone had uh, come across you guys' research, and they knew that you know actually you're more rational or less rational depending on the language that you speak. You know? And it was like this, <laughs> these two people with the North Korean world coming together. Yeah. And in fact, it has such serious implications about how are we going to be the decisions by the There's yeah. there's the introduction to to um, uh, special issue that uh, we wrote. We we hosted as editors with uh, Albert uh, Albert Costa and Boas Caesar. The introduction by a guy who was a counselor for uh, for the White House. Uh -huh. uh, read it because this it's on the cost benefit. It's uh -huh. it's just this is is. What will we win if we speak in the foreign language? What will we win if, if each of us speaks in the native language? And this is not solved. Mm -hmm. In the European Parliament, people have simultaneous interpreters or not, depending on their choice. Mm -hmm. 
some people use the European Parliament as uh, an English academy. <laughs> really, yeah. really. And some others have uh, simultaneous interpreters because it's uh, for them it's easier. The decisions that they make are not the same. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the remaining folks online have any questions? And I need to check how... Oh, chat, chat, oh? chat. Oh. oh, no, no questions. So, yeah, so unfortunately, we have to wrap up. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well,